Well, uh, in, in, the, in my presentation, I will be talking about a few key pastoral challenges. First one is migration and its attendant problems that, well, like most cities, Asian cities develop, survive, and thrive because people are moving, they keep moving, not just rural to urban, but also across uh, urban areas. So uh, the other things will be the over, uh, overpopulation. Uh, in the 2015 Demographia uh, Index, which is the list of about 20 largest urban areas in the planet, 14 out of, 14 out of 20 are Asian cities, and the top eight uh, are actually populated with populations ranging from 20 to 30 million. So these are called mega cities, of course. So and then, of course, as a result of that, because there's the, the density, the congestion, then you have infrastructure problems. So services like uh, garbage collection or sometimes uh, road infrastructures become a problem, and that has an implication on the quality of life. So um, also, uh, the of course. Uh, what most people will know, especially when you look at these mega cities, Manila, Jakarta, Bangkok, Kolkata, uh, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, uh, the poverty, poverty and economic inequality. Particularly, I think what is striking is in a number of the cities, you find islands of wealth in a sea of poverty. So I'm, I'm not sure if, you're, if your audience you're familiar with that critically acclaimed movie Slum Dog Millionaire. So that's about a slum in, uh, in Mumbai. Uh, and, and it's the reality. So these cities are surrounded by sprawling slums. Uh, so it's a contrast. So you, on the one hand, you have these few people who are so wealthy, like Beijing right now has already toppled New York out of the, sit out of the top spot of the city with, most bi with the most number of billionaires. But you know that in the cities in Manila, there are very rich people, just as in Jakarta or Bangkok. But then you have this large, num large segment of population, which is also quite poor. Um, and then, of course, environmental sustainability, because Asia, especially its coastal cities, and there are many coastal cities, uh, in the list done by the OACD, uh, all but one of the 10 most vulnerable port cities in the world nine are from Asia. So this, the flooding disasters and all that, particularly as a result of climate change. Uh, there's also this uh, increasing uh, observation of the decline of marriage. That in, uh, in a number of Asian cities, um, men and in particular women are marrying later or not marrying at all. There are a number of factors. It's not just about the institution of marriage, but also pressures of city life, because it can be stressful, especially for those who are go-getters, ambitious. They really focus on their work. They marry late, and by the time they get married, they're over their childbearing age. So it has an implication on the aging population uh, and uh, the need for more workers. So there's also pressure from the government. So these are pretty much the, it's a kind of a snapshot. There are, it, it's not an exhaustive list, but yeah, these are the things that stand out. Uh, it's multifaceted uh, and intersectional, I would say. Uh, I wouldn't think that you can kind of give uh, an enumerate ways of doing mission in a, de in a detached manner, but they are, you kind of do them intersectionally. Uh, in my presentation, I, I have identified three. Uh, the first one being, mission as integral liberation, uh, particularly in terms of working toward justice, peace, and sustainability. Uh, one of the key things I identified uh, in, that, in, that, in this, uh, I, I call them phases or facets of missions, like features. So it's not the total picture, but pieces of the puzzle. Uh, that mission as integral liberation is about mission among the crucified people. Because uh, while it is true that many dreams are fulfilled and there are many success story stories of people who live in the cities. There's also despair, loneliness, isolation, marginalization uh, among people who live in the cities, uh, especially in the mega cities. So, uh, uh, and these crucified people, particularly the slum dwellers, you know, the shanty towns that really ring around the cities, the major cities, the capital cities of Asia, I think 
there's a lot of work that, that needs to be done uh, among these people. But I say mission among the crucified people because it really is the, the idea of that mission is not the privilege of a few, but a call and a task for all. Because this, the crucified people also have something to give to us, to share to us. Uh, because their way of life, uh, like Pope Francis talks about it in, the, in Evangelii Gaudium, uh, is a story of survival. But in these stories of survival and suffering, we find God in there. Uh, 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 we, we, we find a way of doing mission as well, because their own struggles against injustice, uh, there is a lot that we could learn from there. One key point I would like, I, I raised here is that it also opens up the question of the need for missionaries uh, who are willing to take risk. I call it an ethic of risk, that there's a need for missionaries who may be willing to work in more risky ministries and in more risky areas, like the urban poor, in the slums. It's an entirely different way of life. It's an urban jungle, literally. Uh, I've been to poor neighborhoods in different parts of Asia, and it can be very confronting. So. Um, I was at this conference in India and the priest was saying, he was making an observation that there's a high concentration of missionaries in charity work and that we need more people. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, we, we want to put people, uh, people's lives at risk, but it's just that sometimes it can be difficult. Uh, I would put it this, that we need as much Mother Theresa's because he's saying there are so many Mother Theresa's. We need as much uh, Dom Helder cameras uh, as much as we need Mother Theresa's. So uh, that's the, uh, one of the things I also mentioned. The second uh, facet of mission uh, is uh, mission as uh, a mission in the heart, in and from the heart of the people. Uh, and particularly the whole idea of bonding and bridging. Uh, here I referred, uh, uh, I find inspiration in what Pope Francis said that Spiritual evangelizers are those who strive to light a fire in the heart of the world. I really found that very interesting for me because uh, I just wrote an article actually about chapter five, which is on spirit-filled evangelizers. It came out in the International Review of Mission. I was asked to write on it. And it's a fascinating read into what I call the mystagogy of mission. Uh, this, like, almost like the spirituality of mission because it, 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 it's, a, it's a very raw understanding of the beauty and the pain of human experience and how a missionary is supposed to enter into that and that by entering into that, then you begin to have a clear understanding of what needs to be done. So mission as immersion and connection and that immersion and connection can only come by being a part of the people. Pope Francis says, mission is as much a passion for Jesus as a passion for his people. Okay? And to do that, you have to embrace it by immersing yourself in it. To have, he said, to have wonderfully complicated lives. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing, uh, if I remember what I put in the mission as in, uh, bonding and bridging is uh, particularly have to do with uh, migrants, the loneliness, the isolation, and sometimes the marginalization that happens. Because city life can be stressful, you know, traffic, uh, the demands of work, the rat race and all that. And the diversity in the Asian context, the diversity of groups, cultures and religions, not only that, but sometimes the diversity of, uh, in terms of size, some cities are big, some are small, or the system of governance. Singapore is a city state. Hong Kong is a semi-independent uh, city state but all the others are the normal, except for Chinese cities, of course, it's an entirely different form of government. So you have to also engage that kind of diversity. Within a city, you have all sorts of ideologies, all sorts of groups, all sorts of religions and cultures. So how do you, how do you become bridge builders to that extent? Um, the, the third one is uh, mission as uh, the, I forgot to mention this in the pastoral challenges, but actually the whole idea of digital technology. So if I may just refer back to that, one of the pastoral challenges in Asia today, I think, is the um, digital technology and how it's so much a part of people who live in the cities. It's not only Asia. Okay? Everywhere you go, 
people are digitally connected and mind you even in the most impoverished cities even in the slums a lot of them are digitally connected they have smartphones so and especially the young people uh, the young people of Asia and it's not only Asia because we have a generation who grew up on the internet uh, there's a survey I mentioned in my presentation and that's very much pretty much the reality of most young people in the world so my point in the phases of mission is how do we engage digital technology effectively and wisely. Uh, effectively in the sense that these young people and migrants, because migrants in Asia, like if I speak from the Philippine context, for instance, migrants and their families use digital technology a lot. So they, for me together, I think, make up, the, make up this digital continent. Okay? There's a need for a mission to the digital continent, the digital natives, uh, the Google generation, the YouTube generation. Because I think if we fail to reach out to these young people, we run the risk of losing a generation. And they are the future of the church insofar as they are our young people. They will be the future of the church wherever the church is present. And even for migrants, because migrants today are uh, potential missionaries. So if we are able to channel that, to tap into that possible resource, I think there's a lot of possibilities there. For example, I give you an example, Filipinos are everywhere and they bring Catholicism with them. So even their traditions, uh, priests in America will contact, for instance, the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines around Christmas time because there's this devotion uh, among the Filipinos, which is also spreading. And it's not only among eth ethnic groups because I once went to this church in Chicago where I used to live. Uh, it's an early morning ritual during Easter. It's when Mary the grieving Mary meets the recent Jesus. The Filipinos have a ritual called Salubong. So I brought my husband. My husband is not a Filipino, he's Malaysian. Um, when I go to the church, well, the priest is an American, a white American, and then it's not just only Filipinos. I, I, I would have counted a few other ethnicities there. So it's, there is a kind of a future in the sense of evangelization, a, a way, another way of witnessing to the faith. So, and the other thing, if I may just end this part, is that uh, when it comes to digital technology, how do we use it effectively and wisely? Uh, there is also a need for us to make individuals and families in particular understand uh, the importance of a digital Sabbath. I call it a digital Sabbath, which is uh, when we need to disconnect in order to reconnect with our loved ones. One of the things I find disheartening and I'm really struck is when I go to restaurants and I see couples, I see a group of friends and uh, a family of four, they go out to dinner together and the first thing they do when they sit down after having ordered their, their food is they're all on their gadgets. They're there but they're not really there. And for me it's an, an opportunity that's wasted, an opportunity for connections and relationships that, that, that's really wasted. So I think there is a, there, there is a need there in terms of uh, kind of a putting technology into context. So gathering all this, uh, I, I, what I raise in my paper is that we need spirit-filled evangelizers who are bridge builders, who are ideally technologically literate, and are willing to uh, take risk. Because th these are the ones who, and I say spirit-filled because mission today is not easy. The, the struggles of people, the forms of social injustice, the chat is very complex. It's a, we live in a very, very complex, morally complex world. And to be a missionary today, to enter into a context, is not really just looking at one social issue, but one that's interconnected, especially in the cities, because cities are world hubs. They're centers of power, uh, economic power, political power, uh, all sorts, even ideological power. So, and most of the issues uh, in cities have global dimensions because we live in the age of globalization. So for me, uh, looking for solutions to problems in the cities is not only doing missionary at the mission, mission work at the local level, but also at the global level. So to really have uh, uh, a more comprehensive, a more holistic approach to mission. I wouldn't say that it's limited to Asia, that it's just for Asia. 
because at the end of the day, when you talk about the human condition, there's so much that we share. Maybe if there's something different, it is the desolation in terms of poverty. It's, it's much more in your face, it's much, more, it's much more confronting, it's much more severe, but at the end of the day, I think how people deal with it, the creative resistance, the steadfast faith uh, in, in how they engage and deal with this from the perspective of their own faith is pretty much the same across cultures.